have your attention, Mr. Dennings is, uh, has some, a little entertainment for us, and then Don Humphreys, the author's here, is going to bring the book up and, uh, and talk about his book briefly. He's got a couple books, and he's got, I think, the only copy of Mr. Dennings' book in existence except for the one Paul borrowed at one time. So that's we got the book over there. Okay, Mr. Dennings' book. So uh, let's start with that, and then we'll uh, get to our featured speaker. Mr. Gates, America, Mr. Gates. Somebody told me the other day he was so good at it he could sell aluminum sign to the folks that had brick homes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to spend a lot of time this morning. I'm going to tell you, we all the time talk about whiskey and uh, because I wrote a book that had a little stuff about history in it, or, about uh, whiskey in it, that everybody thinks I'm an expert with his whiskey. But I'm not. But you know, there's Mountain Dew. We don't have Mountain Dew down here because we don't have a mountains. We got stump hole. That means uh, they used to hide it in stumps. Grind it and lay down a dollar or two, drive down the road, come back and get a jug full of whiskey. Then the money be gone. <coughs> now, why did they do that? Because you had to catch people with the whiskey. It was illegal for that. But you had to catch them with it. So they didn't uh, want you to, you know, they, 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 you go down and uh, it was just well known in the community that what to do and how to get your whiskey. So they go down there, lay down a dollar to it, get in the car, drive off, drive around the bend, come back, be a jug full of whiskey, pick it up, and go about the business. But anyway, there was <laughs> that was stump hole. That's that was stump hole. That's white lightning because it's got a kick to it. If any of you ever took a swallow of it. I had a friend that had some of it one time. He said, uh, hey, take a swallow of this. I said, man, I don't want none of that. I, I can't drink that stuff. He pulled out a gun and held it to up his head. <laughs> take a swallow. I took a swallow. He said, now, him, hold this gun on me and make me take a swallow. <laughs> <laughs> that's, how, that's how bad it is. But they call it white lightning. Uh, they call it all. Uh, Moonshine, well, the reason for that is they mostly made it at night. They got in at the night and put a little steel up and make a little little whiskey and take steel and everything and go home because it was illegal. But then there's bootleg. Oh, I mean, have you ever heard it called bootleg? You ever wonder about that? Why would they call it bootleg? Being an old historian, I just happened to know. So I thought I'd lay it on you. Back in Prohibition, when they had the uh, speakeasies and things, and people walked around, it was illegal. You didn't, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't uh, have it. You couldn't make it. You couldn't sell it. You couldn't do anything, drink it or whatever, according to our uh, beloved government. But they came up. Everybody in those days, because they didn't have streets, they didn't have paved streets, and the streets were usually muddy, you know, y'all remember pictures of the old streets, and it would rain, everything be muddy. Well, most people wore boots, remember? They came up, and I know all of you have seen them, but you never thought much about it. It's a little curved container, with a little cap on it, about that thick, curved. You know what that is? That slipped right down inside of your boot and carried your supply of whiskey. That's where bootleg came from. Is that a flask? Yeah. Is that a flask? Yeah, it's a flask. Yeah, we call it a flask. Some people think it went in your vest pocket, but it didn't. It went around your leg. That's the reason it was curved. Because it's fit right down in the pocket. That's the bootleg. Mr. Danny's, Mr. Danny's, come back up. You're not for you. No, no, not too much. Too much. Too much. Too much. Well, uh, Don Humphreys is here. He's the he's the latest author that has some current books out. He wants to talk about it. He also wants to talk briefly about Mr. Gettings' uh, 1980 book. So, Don, talk, tell America about the book and uh, the book. Okay, um, let's get let's get mine out of the way. Yeah, talk about it. 146 years ago, the Confederate gold 
travel these parts and disappear. Uh, I wrote a modern day mystery about seven middle graders whose town was uh, in economic disaster. Um, Aiken, South Carolina. Ad, no, Pretty close, there. Uh, <laughs> fairly close. Anyway, um, these seven kids stumbled. They, they heard about the gold, and they stumbled into finding the gold. And this is the, the book that tells how it was done. It's a really fun read. Please get it it's on Amazon.com, um, Nook, Kindle, Worldwide. Now. Now his book is fiction, and when y'all read it, I'll, then I'll tell you the real story of what happened that goes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's talk about this one. I borrowed this is the only remaining copy of, uh, of The Golden Bay. And I, I wondered about the name of the book. Um, it's kind of a funny name to me. For, and, uh, but it didn't take long to figure out why it was named The Golden Bay. Because that was the name of the white lightning that the book talks about, which is a, uh, a, a really a, is a period piece from the 20s and 30s, depression piece. A very good Americana description. I, I, I want to, I'm going to be working on it hard to, to release a second edition. It's a very, very ex exceptionally good read. You want to know what it was really like in these parts, or a little bit lower down towards around Sumter, right? Uh, in the 20s and 30s and how bad people had it. Uh, people just like us were starving to death <coughs> in this period. And, uh, and most everybody that, uh, that lived in the, in the outback or the woods, they produced their own liquor, their own white light. Then everybody had a steal. Um, and a lot of preachers and a lot of, uh, most people just overlooked it because things were so bad. They were just terrible. Uh, this book, just about a young man, his family was starving to death. He had two kids. Uh, yeah, by the beginning of the book, the second one's being born. Um, and uh, his family is starving to death. They eat what were the grits and cornbread every single day. That's all they had. Because they grew their own corn and had to share it with the mule. <laughs> so, I'm surprised. I didn't think you would make out of corn. Yeah. Uh, well, one thing being <laughs> the white light. So, this was a time of speakeasy, right? <laughs> they didn't make all this money selling this white lightning to the locals. No, they had the contact from up north. And the mob gets involved. It's a very, very exceptionally good book. I'm going to be working on it hard to get it to release a second Two You've got money. We can do this. <laughs> we can do this, brother. You can have it on Amazon sitting beside mine. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Kennedy. It was a great pleasure. I want a copy of this if you have a copy of this. Letters to the Wall Street Journal said he would like to speak today, which is all right, which is unusual. So, and when Thomas Kennedy, Mr. Burbage, and now Ross, don't mention those magic words, to Mr. Burbage. Okay, yeah, wait, please. And, and so we have Suzanne Moore, and Suzanne, uh, she's running for a clerk court, and you'll know, say things to America. Good morning, America. <laughs> and we have another uh, candidate for District 18, and we, we just did an intro video with him, so. Uh, Alan, you want to say anything to America? Good morning. Alan Hunter, for those of you who don't know, uh, so he's running against Ronnie Cromer and Rich Bowling, red team. And uh, we have the third vice chair of the Republican Party over here. Terry, say anything to, to America? Good morning. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know what I'm about to say. That's the most influential patriot in the state of South Carolina. 
Tower was humble, so he's out of black. Corey, the biggest troublemaker award winner from a few weeks ago, Corey Norris over the corner. And to promote some capitalism, we have a professional photography, needed photography service. Are you still selling those birdhouses, Mickey? Birdhouses? Uh, yeah. Still, still selling birdhouses. Bring those in one day. Don't let me miss anybody. Paul, you may say anything, or you don't want to get fired from your job, I guess, right? <laughs> oh, I hope you didn't get that, Ron. <laughs> We have, we have Howard Shepard here, the former president of the Sacramento Railroad Museum. Mr. Burp. Oh, Harvest Hope, uh, Mary Louise Rich. And, oh, is this a check? Oh, thank you. That's $100,000. I wonder how many of y'all were going to. Barack Obama. How many of y'all were going to let him press? And we have uh, the better half of Congressman Joe Wilson here with us, Roxanne Wilson. 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, <laughs> He's a fam our, our famous Springdalian. Oh, Springdalian. <laughs> Springdalian. Yeah. Spring, Springdale's uh, is the municipality that controls a lot of things that goes on out here in South Carolina. We have Congressman Wilson there and Mike Green. Well, Mike's the person behind the curtain. It's from the uh, policeman. Oh, okay, I, I may have missed somebody if I did apologize, but let's move on. Our featured guest, Tommy Windsor. Tommy, he'll come up and talk about why he's running for uh, Lexington County Court. Court. Let's get Tommy around the ball. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for letting me be here today. Uh, uh, I, I appreciate Steve having invited me. And let me tell you all something. Steve wears another hat that is very, very difficult to wear. And that hat is being chairman of the Lexington County Republican Party. I was chairman of the County Republican Party for four years, from 1997 to 2001, and let me tell y'all something, it's like herding cats sometimes. <laughs> it's a very, very difficult job, so Steve, my hat's off to you for even wanting to have, even do it. But my name is Tommy Winter, and I'm running for Lexington County Clerk of Court, and I want you to know that on day one, when I take office, I will repeal Obamacare. <laughs> I just want you to know, okay, it's going to happen. They've all been saying it, so I thought I might as well say it too. We will repeal Obamacare day one in a Windsor court administration. <laughs> so, seriously though, let me ask y'all a very important question. How many of you in this audience, by a show of hands, know what the clerk of court does? <coughs> okay, very good, very good, okay. Now the most important question, how many of you care? <laughs> okay. I care. Okay, very good, because usually when I ask these questions in that order, so few hands come up on the second one. You think a few come up on the first one, so few hands come up on the second one, because we're like, the clerk of court, what does the clerk of court do? I don't really care. Well, let me just give you in a nutshell what the clerk of court does, okay? Very, very quickly, very simple explanation. The clerk of court is like the filing cabinet for the court, okay? Documents that are filed in the clerk's office, uh, the uh, pleadings, the lawsuits, uh, evidence, all that is kept at the clerk's office. They're responsible for keeping all the records for the court. Of common pleas and the family court, they set the docket as to when the cases are gonna be heard. They pull the jury pools for the juries to be selected from. And something else they do is they're responsible for collecting and dispersing all court or child support now money. So a lot of money comes through the clerk's office. Now, the second part, why should I care? I'll tell you why you should care. Because several million dollars of your tax dollars are managed by the clerk of court. That's why you should care. That's why you should care who the register of deeds is. That's why you should care who the auditor, the coroner, Millions of your taxpayer dollars are managed by the person who is the clerk of court. And that is important. And you need to be, to be concerned about who holds that office. Now, why am I running? 
two simple reasons. First of all, I want to cut waste and inefficiency in government. And having worked in government, it exists, y'all. I saw it every single day as to how we could make government run more efficiently. And you know what? For whatever reason, the decision makers just don't do it. I don't know why. They don't want to work that hard, maybe. I don't know. But it's not that difficult to, to, to cut government and make it more efficient. <clears throat> and secondly, I believe that Lexington County deserves better from its elected leaders. They deserve a lot better from their elected leaders. And those are the two main reasons that I'm running. Now, what is Tommy Windsor going to do when he gets elected clerk of court? First of all, I'll tell you this. To make the office more efficient, I want to put all public documents that are in the clerk's office online. If you can go to the clerk's office and look at it, and it's a public document, why can't you pull it up on your computer? They do it in Charleston County. Why can't we do it in Lexington County? Ought to be able to do that. What, how that makes that more efficient is you don't have to have people going back there and pulling files, which the more time that file is touched, the greater risk of there being a mistake being made. So it just makes it easier for a taxpayer to do business with the clerk of court's office. Isn't that what we're about? Making it easier for taxpayers to deal with their government. Second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put the clerk's budget online so that you can see how your tax dollars are being spent. It's your money. Why can't you look and see how the money in the clerk's office is being spent? And actually, look at it how it's compared to other years, if there's been increases or decreases. And if you've got a question about it, you can call me and I'll try to answer it for you. Or we'll get the answer. Other thing I'm going to do, I'm going to put my daily calendar and schedule online so that each and every citizen of Lexington County, if they want to know what Tommy's doing today, they'll be able to pull it up and look at it. They'll be able to see that you know, one of my passions, y'all, is I officiate high school football. That's one of the things I've been doing for about 12 years. And if Tommy's got a game on Friday night, they'll be able to pull up the calendar and they'll see Tommy's got a football game at Rich Spring Veneta tonight. They'll be able to know that. You know why? Because I work for the people. They deserve to know that. They deserve to know what I'm doing on their dime. That's not too much to ask if you're elected leader. It's really not. So those are a few things that I want to do. Now, I'll tell you, having been involved in the party and the conservative movement as long as I have, I get really concerned when I hear elected leaders talk about their office. Okay? When we start hearing our leaders talk about their office, it's time for them to go because you know what? It's not their office. It's your office. You're the boss. They work for you and elected leaders tend to forget that they work for you. You can put them in and you can take them out. You know, we're talking about that, Mr. Burbage, when stuff happens. The people, you know what? They ultimately hold the power. We can change government today if we want to do it. You know why? Because we have the vote. We can do it. And I don't like it when people talk about their office. It's time for better leadership in Lexington County. And I want to offer that leadership. Holding public office is not a birthright. If it was, we would still have a king. And we got rid of that. This is a privilege and it's an honor to serve the people of Lexington County. I will work hard every day for you. I'm going to conduct a positive campaign that is not based on personalities, but based upon issues. Because you know what? That's what you deserve. You deserve that. You're taxpayers. You're, you're the residents of this county, and you deserve better from your elected leaders. I want to set a good example for the people of this county. Like I said, I will work hard for the people of this county, and I would really appreciate your vote and your consideration in the June primary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, questions. Now, now question. um, two questions. One real quick. Is this your first run for elective office? 
I ran for Irmo Town Council when I was 18 years old. I graduated from Irmo, and that fall I ran for town council against John Gibbons, who later, uh, I think it was 10 months later, was elected uh, mayor of uh, the town. He was 47, I was 18, I lost 390 to 200. That was a, just a curiosity. The real question is this. I understand that we have folks who sit in our county jail for two or three years waiting for trial. And uh, it's because largely the solicitor controls the docket, what can you, as a, a, a court, do to make sure that we actually have speedy trials and that the solicitor has not set the docket because he doesn't have enough evidence yet and waiting for a plea bargain or whatever it is so that we get trials that are actual speedy trials? Well, see, that's the, the unique thing about the clerk's office, okay? The clerk controls the docket of the civil court and the family court, not the criminal court. That's the solicitor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so really, I mean, it's up to the solicitor when he calls somebody to trial. That's not up to the clerk. I understand that's not the way it is in most of the United States. Mm -hmm. that we're kind and of unique it's, here in that. We allow the, the prosecutor to determine when he wants to go to trial. Pretty much. And see, one of the things, like in civil court, you don't have a backlog of cases really in civil court because attorneys in civil court they like to sit, you know, they don't want a case to sit in civil court for a long time because a lot of them get paid on contingencies and stuff, so civil court moves kind of quickly. But the criminal court... So don't you, you, see uh, a you see a problem with the way that's handled in South Carolina? The, with the, with the, the, the way this they're, they're setting the trial? Setting the trial. I'll tell you this, having worked in law enforcement, every case is different. And... Um, I will tell you sometimes that uh, it takes a while to work on a case. I've got, I've got securities cases that I work, securities fraud cases in the Attorney General's office that I work that took two and a half to three years to investigate just because of the sheer volume of stuff. Is there a problem with that? I think there should, we should look at ways to speed it up. Yeah, I think there needs to be. I don't think, uh, I don't think it's right for somebody to sit in jail for two or three years for a crime they're accused of and then you know, ultimately, what if they're exonerated and they spent two or three years in jail waiting to go to trial? Or they just make a plea bargain. Just or they just make a plea bargain. And then the solicitor's got a 100% prosecution. So, but that's completely up to the solicitor. So, I mean, I think, you know, we should, if we can streamline government in any way possible, if we can make it more efficient, yeah, I think we need to do that. I have a question. Uh, it's expensive to transfer uh, all your files to the Internet. How are you going to pay for that? That's my question, too. Well, I'll tell you, a lot of your documents are already scanned. Okay? They're already scanned. So all you have to do is transfer them to put them online. So you're not talking about uh, transferring actual uh, uh, documents that, uh, that you can actually fill out online. So you're not talking about processing the documents. You're talking about just being able to see the documents. That's right. I mean, there, there's a lot of people that do work with the clerk's office as far as wanting to pull up, say, a lawsuit, or pull up a plea, or some type of document like that. Those documents are actually already scanned because employees can actually pull up those documents and look at them. And why, if, if, if they're already scanned and it's a document you can look at at the courthouse, why can't you look at it on the internet? I'll give you an example. Really, this is really kind of funny. I went in to get a copy of a court document for my sister out of a, a, a case she was involved in and I walked into the clerk's office and after it looked like somebody had thrown a pile of live snakes into the clerk's office when I walked in the door because everybody was looking and going what is Tommy Windsor doing in the clerk's office I said well I'm here to get a copy of a court document and so they went and pulled the file okay now that's a hand touching that file people looking through it and I looked through it, and I got the document I needed, and they said, well, uh, have you found everything okay? I said, yes, ma'am, I have the document right here. I said, but also, this is a copy of an order from another case that doesn't belong in here. And I'm sure that they went, oh, my gosh, of all the files, Tommy Windsor came in and asked for a file that had something wrong and they had the assistant yeah. file. And y'all, that's not that's nothing against the employee. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's going to happen when you got so many. That's that's well, just a simple mistake. But my point is, is that when you don't have to touch that file so many times, mistakes like that don't happen. 
And you can pull it up online, it makes it easy. What you think is enough money efficient? in the budget to do this? I mean, I'll you, the government's got enough money to do whatever it needs to do. Period. Okay. It's got enough, and you know why anybody that will tell you it doesn't? I'll tell you. They're not, they're not telling you. The, the expense of doing that is not near the expense of placing. You're going to need a program to actually make a document where you can you know, actually do something, a process. With well, let me, let me give you all an example of something that I thought was a really neat idea. Richland County is getting ready to have a fully electronic courtroom with the flat screen TVs in it with the computers and all that, it's going to be fully electronic, just like the stuff you see on TV. Guess who's paying for it? Nope. <laughs> the county bar. <clears throat> the lawyers are paying for it. All right. they should. They're paying for they should it. it. So what's to say when something comes up like wanting to put documents online to make it easier for attorneys and taxpayers to look at these documents, Go into the bar association. Look, this software may cost about fifteen thousand dollars. I'm just, and that's just a number I'm pulling up. I'm not sure, but I'm, you know, if it's going to cost this, is it worth the bar maybe kicking in some money to help do it? Is it worth it? Maybe so. But there's, that's part of my point is that we got to think outside the box. You know, don't always go to the taxpayer for money. We always go to the taxpayer for money. That's easy to do. Government's got plenty of money to do what it needs to do. It's got to spend it right. We may not all have plenty of money to do what we want to do, but we still spend it right. And we can do it. I don't, I don't, I don't accept the fact when people tell us we can't. You know, Newt Gingrich said something in uh, one of the debates, which I thought was really, really, really a, a very insightful comment, was when I think Michelle Botman made a comment about, oh, that, that's 10, 12, 14 years down the road. And Newt Gingrich said, you know what? No, it's not. We defeated Nazi Germany and imperialist Japan in three and a half years, and we went to the moon in 10. When we decide we want to do something, we will do it. And if we decide we want to make government smaller and we want to make it more efficient, we can do it. All we got to do is just say, that's it. We've made up our minds. And we are, you know, we're, we're ready to do it. And I'm ready to do it. And I want y'all to give me the opportunity to do it. So, thank y'all very much. Uh, one more question. Oh, Tommy, I just want to make, I just saw this, this picture. Uh, Tommy worked in Joe's campaign years and years ago. Uh, this does not imply that Joe is supporting Tommy. Joe is certainly supporting my sister. Oh, that clear. Well, I mean, I, I would. Well, I mean, I would have thought that would have been a gift. I mean, I put I put this on there for, uh, because that picture was taken when I was 17 years old. Joe was still a senator. That is at the Lexington County Republican Convention, and I was elected third vice chairman at that convention. Youth chairman. The youth chairman. That was the first time we had that. And there's Jimmy. I put my picture of him in my wedding. <laughs> but you know, I've got pictures with all kinds of Republicans. So, but um, but there's also a picture of me as a referee. I'm a football official, as I said. So let me tell you, I know how to get into the middle. So of does that imply you're endorsed by the referees association? <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. For and by the way, I also am uh, very glad that Steve gave you the title of troublemaker. Because I held it for so long, I'm now very glad to pass that man on to you. Yeah, the endorsement. Let's give time one more round of applause. Thank you. 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 Mary Louise Rich, Rich with Harvest Oak can give us an update what's happening with the uh, their support programs. Uh, and we can get a real idea of unemployment and how hard things are by hearing her update from the business. Mary Louise. Good morning, everybody. I'm just going to do this here. Uh, unemployment is down. We're like number seven or eight, I think. Uh, Lines, it's, it's the end of the month, so lines are pretty long. Uh, we're, we're keeping busy. Um, we, the bill that, that was introduced 
It's actually been introduced to both the House and the Senate. And don't ask me what the bill numbers are because I forgot to write them down this morning for the check off on the tax forms. Uh, they're in House Ways and Means and Senate Finance right now. Uh, if, if you feel so inclined, please contact your Senate and House members and encourage them to support them. Uh, other than that, it's just been a real hectic time. Uh, we're getting ready. We're anticipating the summer months where kids who are on free and reduced lunch, their parents are having to sustain that funding. And, and it's ironic because it's, it's probably one of our biggest periods of service, but it's also the time of the year when we get the least amount of contributions. So we're trying to gear up and, and make sure that uh, we are able to sustain the need during during the summer. And thank you all for those of you who volunteer, those of all those of you who contribute to Harvest Hope, we really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. Next we have one more unless Tal, you have anything to add no, to sir. Okay. Keep one, doing what you're doing. One more uh, special presentation. Unless Corey has an update no, on the people. We have uh, Mr. Bill Burbage, who actually asked to, to speak. So, Mr. Burbage is going to speak. We're going to have we're going to end conversation. We've got to stop at 8 o'clock. We've got filing coming up at 9. Mr. Burbage, you I have hate to even hear what I'm going to say called a presentation. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. I'd just like to say a few words. <laughs> Last week, in a 6 minute and 57 second opinion journal piece entitled Obama's Debt Bomb on the Wall Street Journal, it was a conversation between the assistant editorial page editor James French and deputy editorial page director and columnist Dan Henniger, who writes a column in the journal once a week. At one minute and 13 seconds of that video, Mr. Freed casually states, more or less as an aside remark, quote, the national debt is up to $15 trillion if you count the money that the government has basically stolen from the Social Security and has to pay back, unquote. I emphasize the word stolen, Mr. Freeman's word, not mine. Earlier, the Wall Street Journal ran an editorial about the cardinal sin that MF Global committed when it mingled client funds with company funds to cover corporate liabilities. Does everybody know who Bernie Madoff is? Or yes. Alan, Alan Stanford? Who runs the biggest Ponzi scheme in the history of mankind? Bernie Madoff. Our States. own government runs it. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. This guy just sat right here and said the government stole two and a half trillion dollars. And went right on. It was, there was a kind of a tone of levity to the conversation. And everything the government But we're all stole. in it. And that's why every working person in here, their first priority, is to pay for my Social Security and my medical care. Well, quick, that is not absurd. Bill, I decided I want to send in a letter and stop paying for yours. Just yours. Yeah, okay, I'm just going to make a letter just to them. I wouldn't have well, to keep paying if you quit cashing so in general. I'm just going to say, please, no, please, no, please let, let, me let, me let me make one other <laughs> comment or something that I've just come up with, and I specifically want to direct this as businessmen in here. I think you want to. Thank you. I'm proposing a bill that I'd like to think the congressman ought to introduce called the Full Disclosure and Accounting Transparency Act. I heard some people recently on television, somebody asked a Republican, what is the minimum wage? And he didn't know. Everybody's making a big to-do about what is the minimum wage. What is the minimum wage? Anybody here know what the minimum wage is? Well, the standard number that everybody puts out is $7.25. What the hell does that mean? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. What does that employee cost you as a businessman? Seven dollars and a quarter plus 7.65 percent for Social Security. So you add that on to seven dollars and a quarter, it's seven dollars and eighty cents. It's not seven dollars and a quarter. Now the full disclosure accountability transparency act that I'm proposing is you're going to put that whole number on you on his pay stub and show that his pay is not seven bucks and a quarter an hour, it's seven dollars and eighty cents an hour. And then you're going to take 14, I think it comes out to 14.1%, rather than 15.3, of the total. So that that employee now knows what he's really paying for Social Security and Medicaid. Now half of it is completely unaccountable. It is completely unaccountable. Because all the employee knows is what he sees withheld from his paycheck. Most people don't even know that they're paying twice that. 
I told a lot of employees that are working pretty close to the minimum wage and starting in 2011, you're going to get a 2% pay increase. They didn't know it. Now they're getting it. And they still don't know it. <laughs> so that's what the purpose of this is. Nothing is going to change as far as the government's concerned, except the employee is now going to see the full impact of what he's paying for Social Security and Medicaid. But when you add that to that bill on you, you tell the employer that he's got to pay an additional 15 bucks an hour in order to hire somebody. The minimum wage could still be $7 a quarter, but a hell of a lot of people are going to get laid off because their true cost is so damn high, they lost their job. Well, Bill, what do you think? What do you propose to um, alleviate the problem that we have that Social Security or the pillage of the trust fund has? I mean, what, what, what do you think is the, I mean, what do we need to do? I don't know. I think we need to get it's out. such I mean, a terrible mess that nobody knows how to fix it, and that's why nobody wants to talk about it. Yeah. Well, that's you what can't I'm fix a well, Let right. me say this. That's what I'm saying. You can't fix it. Let me it. say so this. Where do we go from here, though? Uh, out of the federal when, union. When you, when you see even what's being that's discussed, right. Ronald Reagan appointed the Greenspan Commission in 1982, 30 years ago, <laughs> to fix Social Security. <laughs> and after they fixed it back in 1982, the... the, the, the Commission report came out in 83, was immediately implemented. And on the floor of the Senate, the late Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan said, the money is pouring in. They're accumulating surpluses at the rate of, he said, $1.2 billion a week. And it's going to soon go to $3 billion, then $4 billion a week. They're accumulating surplus money. What did they do with it? They spent it. It's gone. The Ross has a That's what he said right here. They stole it. Two and a half trillion dollars. And Mr. Burbage. That's why, that's why, Mr. Burbage, that's why when uh, a congressman or a senator asked for a penny raise on the uh, sales tax or any raise on the sales tax, I say no, because as soon as a pile of money develops, they will spend it. That's right. That's on exactly something, right. but not what it was supposed to be. That's for. exactly right. So, Mr. Burbage, uh, Ross has a solution. Go ahead. Uh, we've got 50 states. We can succeed. Secede. 50 states. 50 that's states that's secession. That's, that's exactly right. If every state succeeds from the union, and we adopt the Constitution that we got with was written, and start over. Let, let me just make one, point, one, one thing here before I If we surround D.C. The only thing that anybody is suggesting now, you see people, within the last year, the Wall Street Journal, Alan Blyder, and uh, <laughs> Who's the guy in the wheelchair that we all know in the uh, commentator? Uh, Charles, Charles Crowley. Charles Crowley. Yeah. All three of them said that fixing Social Security is relatively easy. It ain't easy. So it's not only not easy, it's painful. But when you see somebody, and that's all they're talking about now, talking about fixing it by raising the cost and lowering the benefit, you're trying to fix a Ponzi scheme. You can't fix a Ponzi scheme. Saving, planning for retirement means saving and investing, and there is no alternative. If that money is not being saved or invested so that your own money is being invested to pay your future benefit, then you're trying to fix a Ponzi scheme. Well, and that's the, all they're trying the to do. The only problem with you that can't fix is that American people right. will can't. not save money. So the American, American people... And that's their own fault. We can't take care of that for them. Yeah, but... Uh, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. You can't force people, yeah, shouldn't force people to take care of themselves. I'm sorry. Right. Anyway, here's a flaw. Right. Everybody in here knows that this you're is right. true. Right. And we sit here. Should go ahead. We sit here. Now, somebody ought to be in jail for what Congress has done with Social Security. Mr. Burbage, Tommy had a comment. No, I was just going to say I had spoken to Mr. Burbage beforehand, and I had my my professional life. As I said, I've been an investigator, specifically a securities fraud investigator, investigating investment fraud. And Mr. Burbage is right. When you take money from new people to pay off old people, that's called a Ponzi scheme, and eventually. The reason people go to jail is because new people stop giving money and you can't pay off the old people and the old people get mad. And then they call me and that's when we find out that it's a Ponzi scheme and they go to jail. Well, Tom, didn't they have something called a bailout to help these people not go to jail one time? Well, if you're too big to fail. It's got to be a big Ponzi scheme. The, the reason that I am concerned yeah, about it is this. If anybody in here doesn't think that a 15.3% tax on labor that's what it is. It's a 15.3% tax on labor. If you don't think that's got something to do with a 10% unemployment rate, then you've never cracked an economic oh, book in your life. 
That's the biggest destroyer of jobs in this country is that 15.3% tax on labor. No. It's going into a bond. In other countries, no. We had that, we had a 4% unemployment rate. What? We had the 15.7% unemployment rate. When was that? Now, European, European, European countries. We had the European countries. That's right, but, but that 15.3% that was not always 15.3%. Social Security started out taking 2%. Of three thousand dollars, sixty dollars okay. was maximum so contribution. You know, you know what it is now? Twelve, fifteen percent, or, or whatever. Yeah. It's, it's all relative. Yeah. Yeah. But 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 that number is that's the only tax we have that's been drawn for seventy-five years. And next year they're going to start taxing investment income. It's all stolen. You know, in other words, now they're not only not saving the money that, that you put into it, but now they're going after my savings to pay for the tax. Yeah. Yeah. It's absurd. <laughs> Mr. Burbage, want to thank you for. Uh, Explained that to us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows exactly what I know. You don't already know. You know, Mr. Burbage. All right, all right, all right, folks. Let's give Mr. Burbage a hand. All right. All right. Okay, I'm with you, okay, America. If you see this hat, watch a little bit close. If you see that hat, run for your life. That's, that's Mr. That's Bill Burbage, who oftentimes. Uh, rights are that is a swamp fox on the front of that. Yeah, the swamp right. the international guard. And, and the, are, there are some magic words. Ross, can you tell America what those magic words are? If they see this hat coming, what can you say to get this conversation going? They said it's high. Run for your life. Yes, sir. But, but if, you, if you mention the word Social Security or some magic words like Ponzi that. Ponzi scheme. Ponzi scheme. Ponzi scheme. <laughs> this hat. <laughs> this symbol. I think we should have. That's why it's got well, I think. Mr. Burke. 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 Yes, sir. Oh, I have a, uh, I have a, a point of order over here. <laughs> okay, Cor Corey Norris, I, the, the troublemaker the, award winner, has a comment. The Social Security problem has been solved All right. via Obamacare. We're going to let him die off. Well, then we won't have to pay him. Thanks, thanks a lot. Don't get too smug over there, Corey, because I'm after your title. <laughs> you can okay, it. that's all for this week, folks. Until next week, uh, Steve Eisen signing off in this Casey Mod. Let's give uh, Mr. Bill Burbage another hand. Yeah. <laughs>